always like coming to Chicago. It's always a surprising city to me. It's got so many facets to it. Um, this time I'm kind of struck by the, the greenness, or at least the supposed greenness of everything in terms of like, you know, uh, recycling and everything else. And I saw a really great example of what clearly is the ultimate in recycling. Just walking from the hotel this morning, uh, I was passed by a utility truck, and on the side of it was the label, People's Gas. <laughs> now, if that is not recycling, I don't know what is. Uh, so, I got a talk called One Rule, One, One Rule to Rule Them All. Um, if you're a Tolkien fan, I'm sorry, there's no Tolkien in here at all. Um, that broke I know's heart. The, those of you who have seen me talk before know that I hate rules. All right? People use rules, it's a crutch. It's like a, a way of, of, of passing on the responsibility to somebody else. I'm going to follow this rule and then it's not my fault. Um, and rules are always wrong because a rule is always contextual. Right? It worked for somebody in some circumstances, with some team, with some project, with whatever else it might be. Right? That's not generally applicable. There are, there are almost no universal rules. So what am I doing standing up here talking about a rule to rule them all? Well, I get two excuses here. One is that the rule I'm talking about is not like an absolute. It requires interpretation. And the second thing is, I'm always going to go and call on authority. So here I'm going to call on Emerson, a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds, um, which is you know, one kind of authority. But I would really rather go to the top and go for like you know, ultimate authority in this. So I'm going to be using Yogi Berra. I never said most of the things I said, which that's going to be my excuse throughout. So, what am I going to be talking about? I'm going to be talking about rules for software development, the rules for design, for the processes that you follow, all of these things, right? And you know that there are hundreds of these things that people de develop over time. But to understand where all this came from, we actually have to do a little bit of time traveling. We have to go back to the 90s. I, I, I hate to ask this. How many people here were alive in 1992. Oh, wow, that's way more than normal. You are an old, old crowd. Um, I'm, I'm impressed. OK, so back in the 90s, um, the state of software was dire. We were uh, failing about 70 to 75% of the time. All right. The, 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 the actual stat was something like 72% of software projects fail. And we were struggling. I mean, Yogi Berra probably says it best. We're lost. We had no idea what we were doing. Now, over the years leading up to this and post that time, we had all sorts of you know, ideas on how it should be done. Royce came up with the waterfall method, which like most good ideas, and this is a good idea, was misinterpreted and misused. Right? So the actual waterfall metal method is not evil because it involves way, way more feedback loops than they show on the typical diagram. But that was too complicated. And so people simplified it by getting rid of all the backward pointing arrows and said, OK, so what we need to do is to get the requirements. And then once we've got the requirements signed off on, so it's not our fault anymore, then we're going to get the architecture and we'll get that signed off on and design, code, test, deliver. And then thank you. ultimately, we'll have the little meeting where we say, hey, we'll do it better next time. OK, but this was taken as being the right way to do systems when you bid a project. You know, you would come in and first thing you do is do the requirements. And typically, once you've done the requirements, you would never revisit them. Didn't work that well. But we're always searching for better ways to write software. So back in the 70s, maybe even earlier, people were coming up with things like type systems to help them organize and structure their code, help them reason about their code. 
And when that wasn't enough, we invented higher order type systems, because obviously that must be better, right? Even in the 1960s, people were looking at better ways to write code. And there was a whole movement to look at how can I prove my code is correct. When I went to college, um, we actually had a whole semester class on program proving, which involved looking at the, the uh, pre and post conditions, or actually technically the post and pre conditions of chunks of code and working out how you can actually work out one from the other. And it was fantastic. If you wanted to prove that a loop would add up a list of numbers, I can do it. But if you want to prove that a payroll program works, forget it, it can't be done. So it was an interesting approach. <clears throat> it's still used when you're doing things like hardware design. You know, the languages that you use for hardware design, this kind of thing, have theorem proving built into them, but that's a very limited domain. <clears throat> there are other <clears throat> ways of doing this kind of thing. Today, a big trend <clears throat> or a big thing is 100% test coverage. How many people here aim for 100% test coverage? Yeah? Well, you get, a, you get a pass. You get a pass. I, <clears throat> I think the thing about 100% test coverage is that typically it's busy work. I think, and it has become a religion. It's become a religion in that you, you say, you know, if you want to submit software to somebody, it's like, well, don't bother submitting it until I can see the tests, right? You have all these ridiculous um, linting programs that check that you've got 100% coverage. It's absolute bullshit, right? Because 90%, no, not even that, some large percentage of your code, honestly, doesn't need testing. And when you carry these tests around with you, what you're doing is you're building up a debt. Sorry, a technical debt. I can't, I'm not allowed to use that phrase anymore. Um, you're, you're, you're building a, a, a burden that you have to maintain the tests along with the code. And how many times has it happened where you've changed some low-level API and 50% of your tests break? And you go back and fix it all. Don't do that. Delete the tests. All right? Seriously, there are two reasons for writing tests. One is to make, make it easier to change your code. The other one is to understand what your code has to do before you write it, right? <clears throat> if you're doing the first one, which I applaud, then once you've finished writing the code, delete the test. It has no further point. Anyway, all of these techniques <clears throat> had one basic assumption. And that assumption was, we were trying to produce correct code. Code that worked. Code that met its requirements. And that's got a good history. Laplace, I'm actually going to read this because I can't remember it. Laplace basically said <clears throat> that, <coughs> excuse me, if you had knowledge of the positions and velocities of every particle in the universe, if some being or whatever had that information, then nothing would be uncertain. And the future, just like the past, would be present before this being's eyes. If you knew everything that it was to know about something, then you would know everything about it. You'd be able to predict, predict it. You'd know if it was where it was, where it's going. And that's really appealing. I remember when I came across this in school, it was like, whoa. So everything is predetermined. That's really cool. I like that. All right. No need to do homework. And then, of course, along comes Heisenberg. And he proves that you cannot know position and momentum of something at the same time with any accuracy. And he is a living embodiment with that tie. Um, <clears throat> but OK, so that. Laplace was not quite right there. And then Gödel comes along and puts a mathematical basis behind it, not just for physics, but for everything. He starts off by looking at um, the natural numbers, but then basically takes it to a second thing where he talks about a system 
cannot demonstrate its own consistency. So the idea of correctness is now looking a little bit shaky, right? It's very hard, and I know these are like extremes, but it's, it, there is really not such a thing as correctness in this, in this kind of scheme. And again, if we go to the guru, if the world were perfect, it wouldn't be. Which is, on the surface, a typical Yogi Berra quote. But you could actually form a religion around this if you think about it long enough. What's he actually saying? What would it be like to live in a perfect world? Boring. Why would it be boring? No challenges. No challenges. What could you do in a perfect world? Nothing. nothing. Absolutely nothing. Be Sorry? Oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because in a perfect world, anything you do is going to make it worse. Right? Per perfection is stagnation. Right? Aiming for perfection is basically aiming for some kind of heat death. All right? So it's actually a really quite a profound quote. So although in the past we have been looking at how do we make our code correct, I don't think that's our target anymore. I don't think it ever has been, but I think we have to recognize that. Because I think now our target is dealing with uncertainty. And that trumps correctness every single time. So first postulate, in all but the simplest, most trivial cases, I believe there is no such thing as, perf as correct code. I didn't even say perfect code, I said correct code. I don't think there exists a piece of code that is 100% correct. You may argue with that, but it's really difficult if you want to try and find an example. I have not been able to. Why is your code never going to be correct? Well, first of all, there's going to be mistakes in it, because we're human. But secondly, things change. Things change, and because things change, what was correct is no longer correct. Any piece of code that has you know, even run for you know, six months is likely to be incorrect. There was a report came out in the late 90s that said in the average business application, the requirements, because back then we were still talking about requirements, the requirements change at a rate of about 25% per year. At the end of a year, 25% of the requirements have changed, or 2% per month, half a percent per week. That's a significant amount of change. If you expect your code to be correct a month from now, eh, maybe not. So in an environment where we have to deal with that, what we're looking at is moving from correct code to changeable code, code that can rock and roll. So where do all these changes come from? Well, there are many, many sources. You know, external factors. There's policy changes, law, markets, et cetera, et cetera. You can read as well as I can, probably better. But whatever happens, the world is constantly changing, and the rate of change is accelerating. Those are external factors. Then we have internal factors. We actually force change upon ourselves. We introduce new products. We introduce new features, integrations. We do things like A-B testing, testing new workflows. Regulations come along, and we change to meet those. Um, things like site layouts constantly changing. Oh, there's bugs every now and then. And then, of course, there's the biggest change factor of all in modern times, and that is Elon Musk buys your company. <laughs> so all of those factors are your enemy, in a way, if you view your job as being writing correct code. And you can't fight that, right? 
That's like a dozen city halls. You can't fight any of them. They're just going to happen. So you've got to give up this idea that your code is correct. At least that's my excuse. Just to hammer the point home, things that are perfect don't change. Everything else does. And just to make this absolutely official, we obviously have to go to a Venn diagram. By definition, they're disjoint because perfection and everything else have to be disjoint. And then, well, there's no such thing as perfection. So there's the Venn diagram of the universe. Everything changes. So that was a state in the 90s. Right? We were dealing with this universe that was still changing every second, but we were trying to do it with tools that aimed for correctness all along. So what do we do about that? Well, I don't know, but a group of us got talking at a conference and you know, we thought there must be, uh, you know, we were all trying to find different ways of handling this and we thought, hey, let's get together and it just, it'd be a good excuse for a weekend somewhere and just chat. Uh, Johan so talked about there's a plaque. It kind of worries me because normally you put plaques up for when people die. So I don't know, see if I last this one out. So anyway, got together and to everybody's surprise, we actually agreed on some things. And we produced this manifesto for agile software development. It is not the agile manifesto. Anybody who uses the phrase agile manifesto will have points docked. It's the manifesto for agile software development. And the thing that, the thing about it is that I am ridiculously proud of those four lines in the middle there. Because that is a statement of values that I still believe in. And I kind of hope you do too. All right? These four lines here sum up what I believe not just software development, but a whole bunch of aspects of life should be. So we came up with this. Um, it was kind of interesting. We actually came up with all of this stuff um, by about 2 o'clock on the first day. And we had the room booked, the hotel you know, meeting room booked for three days. So we had to find some other way to fill it up. So that's what those 12 principles, whatever they are, that no one ever reads is all about. This is, the, this is it. This is the meat of it. And we kind of like uh, finished. We looked at each other and said, now what do we do? And um, somebody said, well, we should probably put this up just to sort of document what we've done. So Ward Cunningham went and got the, the domain. And Ward and I put together the most Mickey Mouse website you've ever seen in your life. And published it. And then we gave people a place to sign in to say they agreed. And we thought that was it. And then Ward contacted me and said, have you looked at the numbers? And like at the end of the first week, it got like 1,000 people. And then 10,000, and then 100,000. It was just unbelievably weird to watch this thing grow. And once it became obvious that people were interested in this, well, that's like throwing chum into shark-infested waters, right? Because now what you have is you have the opportunity to make money. And so a whole bunch of people jumped into this and started teaching you how to be agile, which is the most ridiculous thing you can possibly do, because you cannot teach someone how to be agile. You can't tell them what to do, and this will make you agile. It's like, you know, can I make any one of you a ballerina? Probably not. So. I got pretty disgusted with the state of the industry um, as we saw more and more people jumping onto this agile bandwagon and basically using it to con teams into spending a lot of money on something that ultimately didn't work. So <clears throat> I can't remember when this was, I think it was 2015, at a GoTo conference. I uh, gave what actually has turned out to be my most popular talk 
which says something for the state of the industry, um, Agile is dead. And I was complaining about all the things I've just complained about. And then I said, let's go back to the values. Because I think all this idea of teaching how to be agile is total and absolute bullshit. The only way you can be agile is to understand the values and then apply those values whenever you make decisions. So to make that easier, I kind of came up with like a short form, this is how you are agile. Having told you that no one can tell you how to be agile, here I am telling you how to be agile, but it's not quite what you think. The, the essence of agility is really, really simple. First thing, you need to understand where you are. Then you take a small step towards your goal, or at least you hope it's towards your goal. You don't know, but you hope it's towards your goal. You then get feedback, work out where you are now, and you adjust based on that feedback. And then you repeat. Now, this applies recursively. It applies to the very, very top levels of how we're going to do this project. It applies to the very, very low levels. What am I going to name this function? All of these things are part of this nested set of feedback loops. But fundamentally, that's all there is to it. It's remarkably difficult, but that's all there is to it. There are, there's one other side to it, and that's a practical side. And that is, as you're going along, you have to decide what, take, what step to take. Sometimes it's obvious, quite often it's not. So the second thing I suggested is, when you're faced with two or more alternatives that deliver roughly the same business value, Choose the one that makes it easiest to change. Something that we taught our kids from like really early on, and they now come back and haunt us with, is when you've got decisions to make, make decisions that are easy to undo. Or at least don't sweat the decisions that are easy to undo. Think unbelievably hard about the ones that you can't undo. And so here, what I'm suggesting is you're not going to get it right every time when you make this choice. So you may as well make life easy for yourself by following a path which, if you get it wrong, you can just go, oh, that was a wasted half day, and go back and do it a different way. And I think of, of all of this, that's the most important advice. Make future change easier. So again, we're going from correct to easy to change. Easy to change means we're not abandoning the idea of hoping it's correct. We're going to try and make it mostly correct today. But we're going to make it mostly correct today in the context of we will probably have to update it tomorrow. We're not aiming for perfection every day. We're aiming for something that just gets us, gets us through the day. So we're aiming to create things today. This is our job now, to create things today so they can survive long enough to be changed tomorrow. And obviously, tomorrow doesn't necessarily mean the next day. At this point, you say, but Dave, how do we do that? And the answer is a bit like The Wizard of Oz. You know, there's a scene at the end of The Wizard of Oz where Dorothy is sitting there in the, the wreckage of the balloon and everything else. And, you know, she says, now I'll never get home. And Glinda says, oh, you've always been able to get home. All you have to do is tap your shoes together. If I was Dorothy at that point, having just gone through days of trekking through dangerous stuff and dealing with midgets and all this kind of stuff. If I was Dorothy at that point, I would have clocked that damn witch, right? <laughs> I could always get home. Well, it turns out, actually, we can always manage to do that, too, because we've been following principles all along. 
And so I'm writing some code. And I'm writing something in the sales module. I go calculate tax. And oh, it's tax is currently 10%. So I'll do that. And oh, I've got to do the same thing in the refund module. And the same thing. Oh, it's a tax module too. Cool. All right. So you look at that. And every single one of you is going, ah, 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 I know, I know. Because this is what they teach you in How to Make Junior Developers Feel Bad 101, right? <laughs> this is where you go in and you say, you, you hardwired a constant in here. You can't do that, right? No. So what we're going to do is we're going to put some kind of constant in there. Now, if you've been to the second level course on how to make junior developers feel bad, you'll say, OK, but what you've done here is you've hard-coded the algorithm, the multiplication. That's the algorithm, right? So what we're going to do instead is we're going to extract that out, and we're going to have a tax for function. Cool. All right. So what is all of this? What have we just done? Well, I would argue it's just common sense. Some people would argue that it's um, instances of don't repeat yourself. But the reality is, the reason we did all of those things is because we're thinking about how hard would this be to change. Right? When we hard-coded a constant in three different places, you know damn well, if it comes time to update it, you only update two of them. So you move it into a named constant. And then someone comes along and says, oh, but on Christmas Day, we don't charge tax. So now you've got an algorithm to change in three places. So you move it into a code. All of these things are related to how easy it is to change. We give ourselves a simple, single place to express things so that when we change things, we only have to change it in a single place. So, these are just kind of like basic bread and butter, you know, decent coding techniques. But they're motivated by the need to change. Now, we're talking about rule changes here, so let's dig inside tax four. Yeah, this is going to get tedious. So inside tax four, we probably started out with some function that just had a multiplication in it. And then as life got more complicated, that function grew bigger. And we suddenly thought, you know what? A lot of this is data driven. So let's actually move some of this function out into data. Why? Because data is easier to change than code. So we've moved our rules out into a rule table. And that gives us one place to change it. But then we discover, I've got to tell you, coming to the US from the UK, I have no idea how you get anything done, given the tax system over here. Right? So the Pragmatic Bookshelf has, they call it a nexus, in Texas and North Carolina. That's where Andy and I live. Texas is easy. Texas is just standard rate. In North Carolina, they have sales tax based on counties. Counties are totally independent of the concept of cities and towns. So one town can be in two counties. They are independent of zip code. So we actually, on the form, have to say, what state do you live in? Well, we have to say that anyway to get the tax. But then if it's North Carolina, we have to say, OK, and pop up a list of counties, which is so stupid. And then, on top of that, each individual county can change its tax rate anytime it wants to. And so you get these emails saying, Mecklenburg now is charging 3.2% town tax, or whatever it is. And we've got to update that. And doing that over and over again inside this data structure is a real pain in the ass. So what I'd really like to do is to pass this on to my end users. I don't want to have to be a programmer that updates this once a month. So how am I going to do that? Well. Personally, what I would do is I'd put it into a spreadsheet, like put it into a Google Sheet or something, and then arrange a hook so that whenever somebody changes something, you validate it and then use it to update the table. Yeah? Easy to change. And then if this gets to be popular and you know, 
people, people actually use it and it works and everything else, then maybe we can think about sticking it up into a web page and, and doing it that way. But again, easy to change. But now we've got our piece of code, we probably want to start thinking about you know, separating things out because this is going to be a bit of a monster. So we're going to split things out, we're going to start doing some modularity, and we're just going to keep going and going and going until we end up with, you know, like a gorgeously architected system that follows all of the rules. I have no idea how long the list of all the recommended ways of doing software is, but it's probably about as long as all the software that's ever been written. Everybody has a rule that they want to, to give you, right? And I kind of gave up trying to learn all these because I realized that every single one of them is simply an instantiation of make it easier to change. You don't have to remember what all of these rules are. All you have to do is ask yourself which way makes it easier to change. I have a, um, a hole in my brain. I have a uh, 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 it's about the size of a grapefruit missing in my left temporal lobe. It's just a defect. And when that was, it was discovered during, I had a um, CT scan because I had like a really bad infection. And they kind of went quiet and called people in. And, uh, and when I went to see the specialist about this, he didn't even talk to me, he talked to my wife on the basis that I probably couldn't talk. Um, I was quite surprised to discover I could. And so they put me in for a whole battery of tests. And I was the person that blows the statistics because I either got 90 something percentile or I got 10th percentile. And what I failed on every single time was memory. Right? I really do not have memory, any memory. Well, that's not true. I do not have independent recall memory. So if you ask me where something was or you know, where was a conference or whatever else, I won't be able to tell you. I can't tell you your name, likely, because I can't, I can't do independent recall. But the brain being the amazing organ it is, recognized this really, really on and abandoned the idea of learning things the regular way, I have got a killer associative memory, right? I can link things together. And to be honest with you, it's kind of like a superpower. I'm really, really good at it. Um, but that is why in school, I found myself taking all of the classes where you didn't have to remember things, right? I flunked languages. I dropped biology as soon as I could. But physics, you only have to know three things in physics and everything else is derived from it, right? Conservation of whatever is pretty much the only law you have to know. Once you know that, everything else follows. And that was, for me, that was wonderful. I was absolutely, you know, I aced physics all the way up just because I found a way of dealing with it. This is my version of physics, right? All of these things that I can't remember, all I have to do is remember easy to change, right? We've all got too much to think about. We don't need to think about that. So easy to change. Same thing applies to all these common practices, right? And I'm sure there's a lot, lot more. Why do we do all of these things? Because they make it easier to change. So Thomas's postulate number two, is that all design principles and project principles, or project practices, sorry, are designed to make it easy to change. I hadn't really worked this out at the time when I did this, but you know, in retrospect, that was pretty dumb because it should have been obvious that's what I was talking about. So then the question is, how do you know what change is easier? How do you know what you're about to do will be easy or not easy? What do you think, Yogi? 
Yeah. So as far as I'm concerned, there is only one way to do it, and it involves 50 cents and seeing this guy. All right. There is no reliable way of knowing the future, except you all can already predict the future. You feeling brave? How do you do that? How did, I mean, I threw it, it was at least half a second before I got to him. But he knew, and he caught it, he could predict the future. That's yours, by the way, if you want it. It's good water. Um, he knew it, right? I, I am not a big fan of sports, but I am blown away by the skill of some of these, these athletes. And I was watching a baseball game, and the pitcher pitched a ball, the batter hit it straight back, and the pitcher went and caught it. So I did a bit of research. The ball is pitched at about 95 miles an hour. It's hit back at just the average Major League Baseball hitter comes back at about 94 miles an hour. The fastest a ball has ever been returned is 121 miles an hour. All right? It is 60 feet from the plate to the mound, which means that a ball traveling at roughly 100 miles an hour takes about a third of a second to get from the plate to the pitcher. So here's my question. What happens first? The ball hits the glove, or the pitcher realizes there's a ball coming towards him? Which happens first? If I had to guess, it would be the ball hitting the glove. Because a third of a second is pretty fast when it comes to responding to something slightly unexpected. And yet, there it is. People can predict the future just not consciously. It all takes place below consciousness. All right, so this is a, a bogus division. Actually, it turns out to be not quite as bogus as, a, as it looks, but we have a conscious brain, we have a subconscious brain, a system one or system two, or system two, system one. And the conscious brain is what you think you are. It's what you think you're, what you think thinking is, is your conscious brain. So that's where you have your choices, your agency, et cetera, et cetera. At least that's what you think. The subconscious brain is automatic. It has, you have pretty much no control of the subconscious brain. It's just doing its own thing constantly in the background. The fact you have no control over it is kind of interesting. So, Here's a challenge. Look at the next slide, but don't read it. Did anybody succeed in actually, honestly, not reading it? OK, but think about this. You consciously didn't want to read that slide, because you were going to go, I'm going to show him. But you read it. Your subconscious read it. That means your subconscious can read. Which is pretty wild when you think about it. And it's an effect I, I mean, when you're driving down the street, you cannot stop yourself reading signs. Right? It's just happening because that's what your subconscious is doing. It's doing all of this stuff automatically and with no conscious control. It is basically building patterns. It has access to your senses. It has access to your feelings. It has access to your, yeah, this was good, this was bad, switch. And based on that, it is building these complex sets of patterns. If you went to the keynote yesterday, this will be familiar. Right? What you've got in your head is fundamentally, at the subconscious level, not too different to the statistical nature of current AI. AI does this stuff. It doesn't do the conscious stuff, but it does this stuff. 
Why? Because long before we were conscious animals, right, we had to deal with things like, is that a lion over there in the grass? It's looking at the patterns, right? Turning away. Or there's a storm coming. And nowadays, the code is wrong. Right? All of these things are something that your subconscious can do. And at the risk of repeating Linda, this is a fantastic book that describes that. Now, the essence, not the essence, one of the takeaways from this book is you learn, need to learn to recognize when your subconscious is getting in the way of your consciousness, right? With the impact it has on your decision making. But I think there's another way of looking at it. And that is, we are intuitive beasts. Intuition is how your subconscious tells your brain, your conscious brain, that something's wrong or something's different. Right? Your subconscious cannot talk to you. It would be so wild if it could, but it cannot talk to you. So all it can do is make you uneasy or give you a sense of something or make you feel comfortable in a certain place, whatever it might be. Right? It can, it can ad ad address the low-level systems in your body. And that's what it does. When you get that kind of weird feeling in your stomach, subconscious talking to you. There is a really cool book by a guy called Gavin De Becker, who is a, he runs protection for uh, movie stars and politicians. He used to be like a special forces person, all this kind of stuff. And he wrote a book called The Gift of Fear. And in that book, he talks about how almost every single person who has been attacked on the street or wherever, had a bad feeling before it happened. And they chose to ignore it. They chose to say, oh, I'm, I'm not a sort of superstitious person. I'm a rational human being. I'm going to carry on walking down the street. And then they get attacked. I met my wife in New York. I was from England. She was obviously an American. She'd been living in New York for 10 years. We'd walk down the sidewalk or the pavement, as I called it then. And every now and then, I was on the street side. Every now and then, she'd bump into me, sort of hip check me out. And the first couple of times, I thought maybe she stumbled. But then she did it again. And I said, what are you doing? Why did you just w walk into me? She said, I didn't. So we kept walking. She did it again. So we stopped. I said, look, you just did that. Oh, I don't know why. So being the kind of nerdy people we are, we decided to analyze what was going on. So we kept walking, and every time she did it, we stopped and tried to work it out. Eventually, we worked out what was going on. Every time she walked past a doorway where she couldn't see the back, she stepped away from it. Just, and she'd never told herself to do that. It was just her subconscious going, hey, come on, let's take a, take a step out this way. So I think you need to develop your subconscious. You need to work on getting your intuition better, because that way you can start predicting the future. How's that for a superpower? And you do that through getting experience. That is the only way to do it, which means you do stuff. But that's not enough. You have to observe the result. You have to give your subconscious something to work on. Right? Simply giving the input is only half the battle. Right? You have to say whether that was good or bad. And you just keep doing that over and over again. Has anybody seen this book? No, it's pretty absurd. You have. Excellent. This was, um, I guess, in the mid-70s, I think this came out. And I first became aware of it because there was a documentary on the BBC where they showed this guy in action. And his idea is that your consciousness gets in the way when you're playing a game. So his game was tennis at the time. And they showed a coaching session where he was dealing with, I think it was a woman, I can't remember, who had problems with her serve. So what he did is he came out in the tennis court with her with a laundry basket, literally, full of tennis balls and a chair. And he put the chair on the other side of the net on that line, you know, I don't know what they call the inner box that you have to serve into, but basically around about there. And he put the woman at the other end, 
and said, okay, what I want you to do is to throw a ball in the air, hit it, do not aim for the chair. But I wanted you to say, is the ball in front of, behind, to the left, to the right? So she hit a ball, behind and to the left. Boom, behind, boom, in front of, right? And she spent through a whole laundry basket full of balls. And when she was down to like the last 10 balls or so, he said, okay, now I want you to hit the chair. Boom, hit the chair, boom, every single shot. What she'd been doing in a kind of very small way is teaching her subconscious. Because it's your subconscious that moves your muscles and stuff. You're not consciously saying, okay, now flex this muscle, move this, whatever it is, right? You can't do that. You actually don't have any way of doing that, really. So you have to train the rest of your body how to do this. And by giving yourself feedback, you can make that work. So I, just, I looked at this and I thought, okay, maybe this would work for me. Not a stress when it comes to tennis. So what I've started doing, started about a mm, year, year and a half ago, is I have a pad of paper. I mean, everybody has a day book, right? A journal. Yes, good. I see what you mean, Linda. These guys are not going to talk to you, are they? No, no. OK. If you don't keep a journal, keep a journal. Please, please, please keep an engineering day book. You'll be amazed at the difference it makes to your life. Anyway, what I will do is when I'm about to make a change, I got into the habit of getting a piece of paper and writing on it the name of the change, or what the change was, sorry, and then what I thought the effort was going to be, ish. And I don't, I don't care how you measure effort, it's whatever you thought. After you finish, I would write down the actual effort and then any observations. Do not write an app for this. It is really, really important to handwrite, right? One of the things about your subconscious is it gets reinforced by multimodal input, right? That's why you can be thinking about a problem all day long, don't know the answer, you start talking to somebody else about it and immediately go, oh, right? That's why when you're learning something, Saying it out loud is good because it gives the subconscious more input from more sources. So, handwrite it. Don't type it. If you can do this without getting locked up, read it aloud because it gives you that modality thing. Right? Then, what I do is I have a desk drawer, so I use a desk drawer, it's just a little kind of thing, and I put them in there. And that's it. I forget about them. I started by throwing them away after I finished. And I realized if I do that, some part of my brain is going, oh, they're not worth anything. So now I just keep them in this little pile. Right? I swear to you, I never, ever look back through them. I don't need to. And I have discovered over the years, not over the year, that my intuition has got better. My estimation of the cost of change has got a lot better. And I've not done anything. I'm not thinking about parameters. I'm not thinking about anything. I'm just giving myself feedback. This, I think, is the key, right? Give yourself a step up when it comes to intuition. Or as Mr. Barris said, you can observe a lot by just watching. So. I do believe that this is one rule to rule them all, but it's not really a rule. It's a value. Make it easier to change. And because everybody else has acronyms or whatever, it's going to be ETC for that. Make it easier to change. And please remember to make it fun. Time for questions. And as Mr. Barra said, I'm not going to answer if I don't know. So that's it.